he was speaking, I said, oh, I want to meet this guy. My son had already met his, uh, my son Christopher had already met his son. They're both kind of worship people. And after he got done speaking, he was out in the hallway with his notepad, uh, saying hi and talking to people. And I said, I want to talk to this man. I want him to come to Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, just come and present his message in his heart to us. And so I walked around the, the foyer about twice before I got enough guts to go talk to him. And anyway, made contact, and then I emailed them. And long story short, it's taken two years now for him to be here from initial thing. And so when people asked me this past few weeks when I first, uh, put on Facebook and advertised that I was going to be here, how did you get Bob Sorge to come to Madison, Wisconsin, and to your church anyway? I kind of felt that. And uh, I just said I asked him. And I said, you can do the same thing. So just ask and he'll come. And when he's traveling, he's, uh, I keep up with him on Facebook. He has a wonderful family. Uh, he's got a wonderful story about what God did to him. He was a great singer, worship leader, and a pastor, a speaker. And, and now he has to speak with a microphone, and you'll find out why in a minute. But would you give him a big hand as he comes and open your heart to God? chapter 18, and uh, you're welcome to open your hands as we pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that for the privilege of gathering in your name, worshiping you together, and receiving from the living word of Christ. And now I'm asking, Lord Jesus, for 
your grace to empower these weak lips and for your help for every person hearing this message today that there would be an impartation of divine life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Luke 18. Uh, now the parable that we're going to look here in Luke 18, the first part of the chapter, you will notice that chapter 17 is on the end times. And then if you look at the end of the parable, verse 8, Jesus said, I, I tell you, he will avenge them speedily, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? So Jesus finishes the parable with a, mass, with a mention of the end times. Sandwich between two passages that refer to the end times. This is an end time parable. It's a parable that speaks to our generation actually more directly than to the generation that heard it 2,000 years ago because of the nature of the warfare that we face in these last times and what Jesus wants to do in this parable. Now, we don't have to wonder what the message of today's parable is because Luke begins it with a commentary. He's going to help us with it. He says, then Jesus spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. So we know what the purpose of this parable is. Jesus wants us to pray. He wants us to pray, to keep on praying, and to keep on praying, and never give up, never lose heart, but to always live in a place of prayer before the Lord. It's important to Jesus that we have a living prayer life, and he wants to empower it through this parable. Now, what Jesus is going to tackle in this parable, he is going to take head on the number one hot button issue when it comes to prayer. And it's this. Why does God sometimes take forever? <laughs> now, if you don't relate to that, you may now be dismissed. <laughs> it's the universal issue. It's like, God, why don't you answer my prayer now? And so Jesus is going to help us with that. And, uh, and what he's going to tell us in this parable is God answers prayer. But he's also going to give us some understanding into sometimes why God waits in order to answer that prayer. We're going to see it in our parable. Let's come to the parable now, verse 2. There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Jesus is describing a wicked man, a judge who, first of all, has no fear of God. In other words, he has no concern that one day he will stand before God and give a count for his stewardship. He could care less. Secondly, he, he, he has no concern for people. Doesn't regard man. In other words, if you have been victimized, if you have been traumatized, if you have been violated, if someone has done wrong by you, there is no mercy in this man. There's no compassion in his soul. Nothing inside of him that reaches out to help. He, he could care less. And so now a widow is going to come to this man. Verse 3. Now the 
mother was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. When you think widow, the first association that comes to mind, you think of bereavement, death. There's been a death in this family. Specifically, her husband has died. So this is a woman that has suffered loss. This is a woman that understands depression. She understands grief. She understands vulnerability. And she, she is poor, lacking resource. And now that she has lost her husband, an adversary comes along. And he is looking to steal, to kill, and to destroy an adversary that finds this widow and says to himself, easy pickings. She has no husband to protect her. She has no finances. She can't afford a lawsuit. So the adversary comes to pick her off. She probably has a little bit of a nest egg that her husband left her when he died. And now an adversary is coming in to devour that little that nest egg that has been left to her. And the only option now, the adversary thought that she had nothing that she could do to defend herself, but she had one thing that the adversary wasn't counting on. She had a cry. And she went to her judge, lifted her cry to her judge, and said, Get justice for me from my adversary. Beloved, you have an adversary. If you haven't awakened to that yet, it's time to wake up. You have an adversary. I'm speaking of the signal of all the powers of hell. He wants me, he hates you, he wants to take you down, he is against you. Well, actually, it's not so much that he hates you, he hates God. But he can get directly at God, so he comes after God by coming after you, because as the scripture says, you're the apple of his eye. So when you take a hit, God takes it in the eye. Now, the apple of the eye, how many know there's that when you get something in your eye, the universe just stops. Nothing happens until that gets out of there. And God says, when you take a hit, I take it in the eye. So the adversary now comes against you because he has declared war on God. And this gal, she gets herself in front of her judge and says, get justice for me from my adversary. Beloved, when you take your stand at the throne of God, lift your cry to your judge and say, get justice for me from my adversary. You won't have to go looking for a fight. It will find you because there is what the enemy wants. He does not want you to stand there and lift your cry. The last thing the enemy wants is for you to plant your feet at the throne of God. Never be moved. Never give up. Never lose heart. But lift your cry to your judge. If you'll just stand there and lift your cry, the adversary will come. He will try to discourage you. He will try to distract you. He will try to tell 
him to you. He'll try to do anything he can to move you away from the throne of God. But I resolved in my heart, I'm going to take my stand at the throne of God and never lose heart, never give up, never be moved. Because when you stand before the throne of God, you are on the platform that rewrites human history. You are standing at a place that if you will just keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, keep on praying, one of these days something is going to happen. Your judge is going to get justice for you. So here she comes. Get justice for me from my adversary. Verse 4. But afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God, nor regard men. And because this stinking widow will not get on my back, yak it yak 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 lady, would you stop it already? Would somebody put a sock in her mouth? Lady, put a cap on it. And she's like, I have hardly even started. <laughs> Yet because that widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming, she wearies me. Now this judge is not going to get her justice because he cares about her. He was going to get justice because he cares about himself. He's like, I'm not, I don't think I'll have a sane moment if I don't if I don't do something here, this girl is never going to give up. He steps out of his office, and boom, there she is. Get justice for me, from my adversary. This guy can't step on the public property. He goes to a restaurant, takes his wife out, candlelight, live music. It's romantic. They step out of the restaurant, and there she is. Get justice for me from my adversary. His wife says to the guy, do something about that lady or you won't have a marriage. So this man is going to give her justice for his own sanity's sake to be contrasted with your heavenly father who is not hassled by you, who is not inconvenienced by you, but actually who loves it when you plant your feet at his throne and never lose heart, never turn aside, never give up, but always lift your cry to your judge your heavenly father is like, I love this, Proverbs 15, verse 8. He loves the prayer of the righteous. And he welcomes when we set our eyes on him alone. Verse 6. Hear what the unjust judge said. Now, there's one thing that my translation doesn't reveal in verse 5, what the judge, what the judge said. Your translation may do it, but in verse 5, inherent in the language, it actually means this. Less by her continual coming, it, it's actually in the original, unto the end. In other words, this girl is never going to give up. She is going to take this thing to the very end. She's like, either I die, or you die, or you get justice for me, for my adversary. And he's like, she will never let this thing rest. Here, what the unjust.
just judge that. Verse 7. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night, night and day, day and night, night and day? Shall God not avenge his own elect? That word elect, it's a term of affection. God has gone across the face of the planet and has chosen you, has chosen you, has chosen you. You, my sister, have been hand-selected, personally chosen, the elect of Jesus Christ. It's a term of endearment, a term of infection. Shall God not avenge his beloved ones, his chosen ones, the dearly beloved of his heart? Shall God not avenge his beloved elect? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is obvious. It's an obvious yes. Jesus is actually, in a rhetorical way, making a statement. God shall avenge his elect. Never give up. Never lose heart. Never back off. Always lift your cry to your judge. Because Jesus has said it, God shall avenge his elect who cry out to him day and night. When God brings justice to your life, if there's something broken, if there's something that's wrong in your body, justice brings healing to that which is broken. If there's a relationship in your family that's not right, justice brings healing to that relationship. If there has been a, 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 a financial thing that has come through and devastated in your life, justice brings healing to that financial devastation. Whatever the enemy has done to steal, to kill, and to destroy, beloved, you are the elect of God. He has no business ripping you off. And when your adversary comes against you to steal, kill, and destroy, justice says it's wrong. This must be made right. That's why we pray for healing. That's why we pray for deliver, deliverance. That's why we pray for reconciliation. That's why we pray for financial provision. Because the enemy steals. But our Heavenly Father says, I will bring justice to your life. I will hear your cry. And justice will be served. controversial part of our parable today. It's the last part of verse 7. Shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? Now, depending on your translation that you have in your uh, uh, I got the new King James. Does anybody here have the have that NIV? Maybe we got an NIV. Okay, I'm going to do a little bit of translation bashing this morning. Buckle your belt because I'm coming after the NIV. Anybody got an NAS this morning? Uh, I'm after the NAS today. Anybody got a Message Bible? Buckle up, I'm coming. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, if, now, if you got the King James today, you're going to win. They're like, I knew it. <laughs> so, uh, if the King James, and they're going to win today. The new King James is going to win. But, now, here, now here, here's the problem. The translations have a controversy on this, on this verse. And, Paula, 
I, I traveled the world, the, the Russian Bible blows it, the German Bible blows it, the Spanish Bible blows it. I, I'm not sure about the Portuguese Bible, but uh, it's like all the translations have a problem with this verse. And here's why. There's a paradox in the verse. A paradox is when there are two truths that appear on the surface to contradict each other. There's a, con there's a paradox in the verse. And when the translators bumped into the paradox, they were like, oops, Jesus, you kind of uh, got yourself in a pickle there. And so they decided to help him out. <laughs> How many know it's a little bit dangerous to tell Jesus what to say? I'm like, okay, I think he's got the IQ to say it the way he meant it. But they're going to help him out of this thing. So here, now here's what the NIV does, here's what the NAS and RSV, what, what many of the translations do is they take the second half of verse 7 and turn it into a second sentence, into a, into a second question. So if your translation has two sentences with two questions in it, they blew it. Because there are not two questions in the verse. There is a question followed by a, 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 a statement, a, a complimentary statement. So now, for example, here's what the NIV, NAS, and so on, what they do is they'll, they'll do the verse like this, verse 7, And shall God not avenge his own elect to cry out day and night to him? Question mark. And then they have a new question. Will he bear long with them? And so now there's a second rhetorical question there. If there's a second rhetorical question, the obvious answer would be, no, he won't bear long with them. That is not what Jesus is saying. He's actually saying the opposite. That's why I got a little bit of energy about it. Because when they tweaked the translation, they had Jesus saying the opposite. What he's actually saying, and the New King James gets it right, verse 7, And shall God not avenge his own elect to cry out to him day and night? Obviously he shall, though he bears one with them. Sometimes God bears long with us. It's not a question, it's a fact. I did a word study on the word long. Guess what it means? There you go. you can 
can use to work in my life. Have you got another tool? Wait on me. It's his favorite tool. He's always reaching for it. What is it with God and the waiting thing? I felt low. I felt like he put me in his crucible. Stuck his Bunsen burner under me. Anybody remember those Bunsen burners? Yeah, okay. Stuck me under his Bunsen burner. Put the flame on high. Stuck me in the crucible. And then said, wait on me. Okay, God, I'm willing to wait on you, but can we do this somewhere else? He's like, no, 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 no. Now that I've got you in the fire, let's do this thing. How many of us discovered that when he gets you in the fire, he's going to like, let's maximize the moment. So he's like, okay, we're going to, uh, you know, I'm thinking, okay, God, you're probably going to work on JKL. He's like, yeah, I'm going to work on JKL, but I'm going to start at A and work all my way through to Z. We'll get JKL in the process, but while we've got you here, let's maximize the moment. When God gets you in the crucible, He messes with everything. And you're like, Lord, can we get on task? Oh, yeah, we're on task. We're just going to change you into the image of Jesus Christ. Wait on me. How many have discovered that when you're waiting on God, you can't tell a soul? Because if you tell somebody you're waiting on God, there's nothing that's true. You talk about controversy. There's nothing more controversial in the body of Christ than waiting on God. We love it when they sing the song. We love it when the preacher preaches the message. But when you actually go to leaning on God, nobody will like it. Everybody has an opinion. Everybody has a theology. And you, you, there's no faster way to surface all the theologies in the body of Christ than to go to wait on God. And now everybody has an opinion. Waiting on God is just controversial. The translations have a controversy with this thing. The body of Christ has a controversy with this thing. Yeah, you, you say you're waiting on God. You're just using that as an excuse for your laziness. I've discovered waiting on God is not for the lazy. Waiting on God will, will demand every resource of your being. Waiting on God is not sitting by the pool sipping on lemonade. Waiting on God is possibly the most violent thing you will do when every circumstance in your life is screaming at you. Do something and do it. God has just say, wait on me. There is no hotter fire than waiting on God. I felt like the Lord asked me on one occasion, but do you want to be healed or do you want to be changed?
waiting on God will require every reserve of your soul. It's the most violent thing you can do. Wait on God. And when I say wait on God, I mean like this widow. Get justice from me, from my adversaries. Never lose heart. Never give up. Never shut up. Never be quiet. Always lift your cry. Oh, I, I want one of my definitions for waiting on God. Putting pressure on the kingdom of God. Jesus gives us in this parable one of the most powerful prayers you can pray. You probably pray the Lord's Prayer. How many pray the Our Father, which are in heaven? Yeah, we, that we, we like to pray that because Jesus gave it to us. Well, he gave us another prayer that most people don't pray. It's right in verse 3. Seven words from the mouth of Jesus, get justice for me from my adversary. A seven word prayer that is absolutely powerful. And I would like to bring it to your attention. I'd like you to add it to your prayer belt because it's a powerful prayer. One of the most powerful prayers you can pray. And here's why. When you cry out for justice, justice involves two things. Number one, it involves restoration. When the adversary has come and stolen from you, justice demands a restoration of that which was stolen from your life. It was wrong. You're a child of God. The adversary has no right to touch you. It was a violation of justice. And now, justice demands that the adversary cough up everything he stole from you. Justice demands a restoration to original condition. But, if the adversary has stolen from you and then God bears long with you, there's another element in justice that kicks in. I call it restitution. Restitution has to do with punitive damages for something that you've been that you've lost for a long time. If you've lost it, but then been without it for a long time, justice goes okay. If we're going to bring justice to this situation, not only must there be a restoration of what was stolen, there must be restitution for the years you were without it. And if you've ever followed legal cases, I don't know if you've ever noticed in legal cases, sometimes we'll put them in the paper or in the news, and you'll notice there is a rest of restorations that, that in, in the settlement. There's a restoration. Like, okay, you get a million dollars for what was what was done wrong. But then there's a restitution part of the settlement that many times is much more than the restoration. I remember a case that was in the news one time, like the, the restoration part, they got two million, but then the restitution part, they got 18 million. So there's, there can be a lot more involved in the restitution side of it, because you were not only ripped off, but you were ripped off for a long time. Let me illustrate this from the Bible. 
just uh, says to Joseph, Joseph, they stole your freedom from you. Justice says, give Joseph his freedom back. Release him from that prison. Restitution goes, just wait a minute here, excuse me. If you just give Joseph his freedom back, you are not answering for the years he spent in that prison. For 10 years, the water that's gone under the bridge, the losses that Joseph has endured, because he was not only in prison, he was in prison for a long time. And now justice says you have to answer for the length of time that Joseph was in that prison. So when justice comes to Joseph, not only does he get his freedom back, that's not good enough. Restoration says you've got to give Joseph the throne. Another example, when justice came to Job, and Job was ripped off, the adversary took the lives of his ten children, took his possessions, killed his servants, took his health, and went restoration. When justice came to Job, restoration says, you've got to give him another son and ten kids, and you've got to heal him and restore his imperfection to him. Restitution goes, oh, wait a second here. You just give him another set of ten kids. You are not answering for the ten that he lost. And you are and you just restore him to his profession. You are not answering the hell that this man has just come through. Restitution says that's not enough. You gotta give him more. You've got to give him double his wealth. But that's still not good enough. You've got to give him the first book in the Bible. But that's still not good enough. You have to give him a, a spiritual inheritance in every generation from that day to the present. But that's still not good enough. Restitution says you've got to give him a vision of the throne. And Job saw God. He was caught up into the glory of he saw the throne of God, and Job comes out of the thing saying, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Amen. I'll give an illustration for the sisters. Elizabeth. When justice came to Elizabeth, Restoration said, give Elizabeth a baby. Her, her motherhood was stolen from her. It was wrong. And restoration demands that her motherhood be restored to her. Restitution goes, oh, wait, 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 hold on a second. You just give Elizabeth a baby. You are not answering what this gal has come through. She has come through years of reproach. She has come through years of heartache. How many nights that she spent her pillow wet with her tears. A lifetime of agonizing through her barrenness. God hear me. God answer me. God, give me a baby. Restitution goes, it's not enough to just give her a baby. Elizabeth, you get a baby boy. But that's still not good enough. Elizabeth, you get a prophet. But that's still not good enough. Elizabeth, you get more than a prophet. You get John the Baptist. Restoration and restitution. There's a principle in the book of Proverbs. I'm reading now Proverbs 6, verse 30 and 31. Be 
people do not despise the thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he is starving. Yet when he is found, he must restore sevenfold. He may have to give up all the substance of his house. There is as much as a sevenfold restitution that God will require of the thief who has come and stolen from your life. But because you stood at the throne of God, never lost heart, never gave up, now God comes with restoration and restitution, a sevenfold restitution. And I'm telling you this morning, Pastor Bob, I am no longer interested in simply restoration. When you've been in something long enough, how many of them have figured it out? When you've been in something long enough, your prayer changes. I used to pray for this, and now I'm praying for this. I'm looking for justice. Get justice for me from my adversary. I want both restoration and restitution. And actually what that means for me, Bob, is actually right in that verse, in that in Proverbs 6, 31, it said, he may have to give up all the substance of his house. Okay, I'm just going to tell you a little secret now between you and me. Here's what I have in my heart when I ask God for restitution. Now, whatever he wants to give is a damn, but here's what's in my heart. I want to plunder the house of my adversary. That's what I'm after. When you've been in an affliction like I have been for 22 years, when you're in the house of affliction for that long, you make friends. It's no longer enough that I get released from the house of affliction. I've got some bodies in this prison now that I want to release to. I want to plunder the house of the adversary. I got a theory about Joseph. I don't, I can't really prove this one with the verse, but I'm telling you how the thing works. When Joseph got out of prison, he was given authority over that prison. And I think Joseph paid a visit to that prison. He got out and he went back to that prison and said, okay, you're coming out. You're coming out. You're coming out. You're standing. <laughs> and now that he had authority over that prison, it wasn't enough that he was self released from the prison. He wanted to get some of his bodies out of that prison that didn't deserve to be there either. And now that's the cry of my heart, Paul. I don't simply want to be delivered from this affliction just myself. I want to plunder the house of the adversary who is holding men and women in his prisons of affliction and infirmity and disease. And I'm asking Jesus when he brings justice to my life to bring authority over that house. I want to plunder that house. I got an email one time from a medical professional, and uh, the the was a brother in Christ, very sincere. He wrote me a, 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 an email, and he said, he'd heard about this, and he said, Bob, I'm gonna encourage you to sue the doctor that did this to you. I had a medical procedure, and it went bad, and, and so, we don't know what happened, but ever since. And this medical professional, I want to encourage you to sue the doctor. He said, you're not bitter, you're not angry, you're not vengeful. You are simply taking advantage of, of the provision of, of, of the whole insurance system. He said, medical professional. 
professionals were putting it into the malpractice insurance industry specifically for people like you. It's there a provision for someone like you. Take advantage of the provision. You're not going after the doctor, you're going after his insurance company because you are you're the profile the whole industry is built for. suing in some earthly court, I'm suing in a heavenly court. If you think that I'm going to be satisfied with a measly three million bucks, you got another thing coming. I haven't been in this thing for 22 years, wrestling with demons, engaging with depression, fighting for the, for the word of faith, fighting for the promise. I haven't been in this war for 22 years to settle for a measly three million bucks. I'm looking, yeah, I'm suing, but I'm suing in heaven. I want justice. I want restoration and restitution. Justice for what they have. 
her story is stunning. You're like, here it comes now. For restoration and restitution. And Jesus says, you better buckle up. It's going to shake down speedily. I see this throughout the Bible. Noah, you're going to wait forever. But when the flood comes, bam, it's going to happen. Job, you might have to wait a long time. But when God delivers you, bam, it's going to happen. Abraham, you might have to wait 25 years. But when God steps into action, you're going to get everything. Jacob, you might have to wait till you're 130 years old. But when God gets into you, it's going to come down so fast, you will be dizzied with how fast it You get a house in a field. You get a house in a field. 
You get a house on a wheel. You get a house on a wall. You get a house on a wall. You get a house on a field. And it's Caleb's turn. Caleb's like, I don't just want a house on a field. I just did 40 years in the wilderness. 40 years ago, I would have been happy with a house in a field. I just did 40 years in the wilderness. I'm not asking for the same thing anymore. I want more. I want a mountain. Caleb, who do you think you are asking for a mountain? Everybody else is just getting a house in the field. Why should you get a mountain? he did the time. Once you've done 40 years in the wilderness, it gives you the credibility with man and the authority with God to ask for and to take a whole mountain. I can imagine the Lord like, Lord's like, you know, Caleb, I love you, man. You are my kind of guy. You're a man of faith. I just love your devotion. Never shot up. 
Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. How many's on a journey? How many's on a journey, right? Where are you at your journey? Are you at the beginning of your journey, the middle of your journey? Are you at the end of your journey? Is it 40 years, 40 days, 40 nights? Where are we at in our journey? Nobody really knows except for God. Right? Nobody knows, but God knows where you're at in your journey. Amen? But there's victory at the end of the road. Which is victory. Amen? I was thinking about Romans where it says, stand firm. Stand and don't be moved in what you believe in. Amen? How many going to pray that prayer this week? Huh? Help me get justice from my adversary. That's interesting. Uh, help me, Lord, get justice from after. Because we're all in a journey. We're all in, and we know the enemy's trying to destroy us. He's giving justice. How many would say today, I need help on my journey? I need to help my faith to be where it needs to be. I need to be in a place where I will trust God. So at the end, when the restitution and all that happens, we're going to receive it with joy. Hang in there. Uh, 40 years. I love that story because Caleb was also put in authority too over the children of Israel to distribute uh, the land and the places where they were. So God gave him his faith hung in there. I never thought about the fact that he was with all the, the non-believers at the point, but <coughs> that really touched me. So we're in this land. We have a destination that God has for us. And in our journey, no matter what you're going through, I mean, hang in there and have faith and believe. Amen? Believe. How many's going to believe a little bit more today? Huh? One or two of us? Okay, I'm going to believe all the way to the end of my journey. Don't worry about what part I'm at, because I don't know where I'm at in the journey. I just know I'm on a journey. And we're going to have victory on the other side of that journey. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we love you. We praise you. We give you glory and honor. Lord, I thank you that our faith has increased today. Because we recognize that you are against our adversaries. And we're just going to cry out day after day after day. God, till we're fully restored. Maybe to the day we see you face to face. Hallelujah, what a glorious day it will be. God, bless your people. Give them peace.